This video is sponsored by Surfshark VPN. Have you ever failed at achieving your dreams at a young age and felt like you've lost your chance forever? This must have been what a certain imperial concubine of the Tang Dynasty felt when she was forced to become a Buddhist nun after her emperor husband died because she didn't bear him any children. By all conventional rules, this should have been the end of her life as she knew it. She would have to spend the rest of her days reciting sutras and eating vegetarian and just waiting for reincarnation. But this concubine was not one for following the rules. No, years later she will go on to become the only female emperor in Chinese history. So how did she do it? To understand, we have to go back to the year 624 when she was born. In the same year, a total eclipse was visible over China, traditionally an omen of great change to come. The historical records didn't preserve her birth name because it rarely did for women, so I'm just gonna call her what she's conventionally known as, Wu Zetian, which is not something she actually ever used as the name, but I'll, I'll explain it later down the line. Anyway, Zetian was born to a kind of new money family. Her father, Wu Shiyue, was a merchant who made a killing selling lumber during the previous dynasty, Sui. The Sui dynasty was really unique in that it started off amazing, having reunited China after 400 years of war-torn chaos, but its second emperor messed up terribly. <laughs> He was way too ambitious for his own good, like, he wanted to be one of those emperors whose glory goes down in history, who really changes the world, so he conscripted the masses for a series of gigantic construction projects. Hence why Zetian's dad was able to make a fortune selling lumber. But the emperor didn't factor in the human cost of these projects. The way he rushed them ended up killing millions of workers, and finally the whole country had enough and rose up against him. One of the revolutionary factions was led by Li Yuan, the emperor's maternal cousin. Seeing the tides of fate turning against the Sui dynasty, Wu Shiyue went up to Li Yuan like, Oh hey, heard you and your son are trying to pull off an uprising. Oh my Chinese gods, I feel the same. Come stay in my house, I have so much money. Yeah, 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 take it all, take it all, go pay your troops, like, use it for the revolution. Power to the people! And his gamble paid off. The Li family were the ones who ended up pulling off the revolution. So Wu Shiyue landed a cushy job after the establishment of the Tang Dynasty. This man was very good at seizing opportunities. This will be genetically relevant. If you are also one for bending the rules and seizing opportunities, I gotta tell you about the sponsor of this video, Surfshark VPN. Surfshark's been sponsoring me for a long time now, and oh! <laughs> And I'm happy to keep talking about them because I'm a personal satisfied user of their product. All these big media companies want to block content off from me because of regional licensing agreements? Please, okay, I've already accepted the fact that you listen in on my conversations to show me more targeted ads, and you also sell my data to shady companies that phone me in Mandarin at 7am. Just, just let me watch the damn show that I know you have! Thankfully, with Surfshark, I don't need to physically move to another country to watch uh, something that's only accessible there. All I need to do is click one button and the internet will think I'm there. And the best thing, one Surfshark account has unlimited installations. So I have it on my phone as an app, on both my computers as a desktop program, and all my browsers as an extension. I use different versions depending on what I'm doing. But mostly, you'll find it super useful when watching streaming services or even just videos right here on YouTube. You see a video that says, oh, this video is not available in your country? Nice try. You can just scroll down Surfshark VPN's list of countries and pick one that the video would be available in, and there you go. Even if you're not watching something that's blocked for you, it's good to just leave the VPN connection on because it encrypts your data. I've never had any speed problems, so I never noticed. You can use my code ZHAO to get it for 83% off plus three extra months for free. They have a 30-day money-back policy, so you have nothing to lose in deciding to try it. I'll put the link in the description below. Power to the people! And back to the Wu family. Sadly, even though Wu Shiyue was part of a winning revolution, his first wife died very soon after the Tang Dynasty was established. His good buddy Li Yuan, now the new emperor of China, was like, Oh man, I'm so sorry, bro. But if you need a new wife, I am happy to appoint you one. Because emperors could do that. Wu Shiyue was like, yeah, you know what, I have so much money, but since this is ancient China, I keep getting looked down on for being a merchant. I would like to marry into aristocracy this time. 
And so the wife that the emperor chose for Wu Shiye was Lady Yang, a member of what was once the Sui imperial family. They may no longer be the ruling dynasty, but their social status was still pretty high up there, since China had a policy of treating the previous imperial family well after the war and stuff was settled. Lady Yang was 44 and Wu Shiye was 46, but amazingly, they ended up having three daughters together, the second of which is our protagonist, Zhe Tian. Legends say that when Zhe Tian was a baby, a fortune teller Yuan Tiangang came to her estate. Upon seeing her mother, he was like, oh ma'am, I can tell by your bone structure that you have born some very noble children, because face reading was a thing back then. It kind of still is. It's like a mystical version of judging someone by their looks. Anyway, the fortune teller then went on to appraise the children of the Wu family. First, Zetin's two stepbrothers from her dad's previous marriage were brought out. The fortune teller said that they they could eventually become the rank 3 officials, which is pretty high up there, but since their dad is already a rank 3 official, it meant that they weren't really gonna make the family any greater than it already was. Then, Zetian's older sister of the same mother was brought out. The fortune teller judged her to have a noble future, but she would bring bad luck to her future husband. Finally, toddler Zetian was brought out, though she was dressed in boys clothes that day for some reason. The fortune teller was like, hmm, this lad seems striking, though he's hard to read. Let me see him walk a little bit. And so Zhe Tian was put on the floor and made to walk. Then the fortune teller freaked out and was like, Oh, this kid has the eyes of a dragon and the neck of a phoenix. It's too bad he's a boy, because if he were a girl, she'd become ruler of all under heaven. Now, this story sounds very made up, and it probably was. But who knows, it's in the definitive historical records of the Tang Dynasty, so I have to tell it to you. <laughs> Founding emperors of dynasties, and Zhe Tian counts as one, tend to come with a bunch of spooky mystical stories to justify how they were meant to have the mandate of heaven all along. Anyway, as a daughter of a rich family, Zhe Tian didn't really have to do domestic chores, so she was encouraged to read and write by her parents. She spent her childhood moving around China because her dad jumped between various regional government positions. Wu Zhiye had it all. He was a self-made man who first earned himself the riches, then got status from his emperor buddy and aristocratic wife. And then he died. Almost immediately, the huge family that was held together by him fell apart. Because all his daughters with Lady Young were unmarried, so they were technically entitled to a cut of the inheritance. But this severely pissed off his two sons from his previous marriage because they thought that they deserved it all because they had penises. They started bullying their stepmom and stepsisters, including 12-year-old Zhe Tian. It got so bad that Zhe Tian was like, Okay, that's it. I'm leaving for the palace to become a concubine. Her mom wept and sobbed at her decision, but she was like, Mom, stop crying like a child. Who's it to say that it's not my destiny to meet the son of heaven? Bold attitude! Unfortunately, wrong son of heaven. Because the emperor by then was Emperor Taizong of Tang, who is 39. Which is far from the worst age gap an emperor has had with a concubine, but Zhe Tian, who entered the harem for real at age 14, came at a really bad time in his life. The year before, his beloved main wife, Empress Zhang Sun, had died. Then the years after Zhe Tian entered the harem, Taizong got tangled up in a succession crisis between his sons. Cause here's the thing about Taizong, he didn't take the throne legally. No, when he was 28, he launched what is now known as the Xuanwu Gate incident, where he killed two of his brothers in a sneak attack at the palace's Xuanwu Gate. And then he also killed all of their young children and finally forced his dad to abdicate the throne to him. This was because he won so many military campaigns during the founding of the dynasty that he's considered a co-founder. And his achievements outshone his crown prince brother so much that his brother was planning to kill him to remove him as a threat. So this massacre was technically self-defense, but no matter how you spin it, he got the throne in a very violent and illegal way. So to redeem himself, he vowed to be become the best, most humble emperor the Chinese people had ever seen. Because otherwise, he knew that the historians would just rip him to shreds in their writing. And he was so committed to being good that he readily encouraged his officials to criticize him. The one who did this the most enthusiastically was Wei Jin, a scholar official who was not afraid of anything. He had actually worked under the formal crown prince and had encouraged the prince to kill Taizong. And after the massacre, Taizong summoned Wei Jin to the throne room and was like, so. Heard you told my brother to kill me. 
And Wei Jin was like, yeah, and he would still be alive if he had listened. From then on, Tai Zong basically hired Wei Jin as his professional ego checker. There are lots of famous stories between them, like this one time that Tai Zong was playing with an exotic bird, and he got told that Wei Jin was coming to discuss things with him. Tai Zong knew Wei Jin would give him an earful about slacking off if he saw the bird, so he hurried to shove the bird into his robes to hide it. When Wei Jin then arrived in the meeting chamber, he knew Tai Zong was hiding something, so he talked and talked for so long that that the bird had suffocated by the time Taizon took it out again. <laughs> That's somehow not as fun of a story when you tell it in English. Then this other time, Taizon and Wei Jin were again discussing something political, but Taizon got fed up and turned to leave. Astonishingly, Wei Jin grabbed Taizon's dragon robes and kept on talking, which pissed Taizon off so much that he stormed back to the harem like, I'm gonna kill that peasant this time, I swear. Then his beloved Empress Zhang Sun, hearing about what happened, went and got dressed in her finest ceremonial robes and came back to prostrate to him. He was like, wait, what's going on? To which she responded, I've heard that only wise and noble emperors have officials that are honest with them. To have Wei Jin be so straightforward with your majesty is very proof of your just rule. So how can I not congratulate your majesty? See, Empress Johnson was the kind of woman Tai Zong liked. She was intelligent and opinionated, but always knew to take a back seat to men. In her own words, it is ultimately improper for a hen to crow at dawn. To have a woman interfere in politics is to bring misfortune. By which she means that the wives and in-laws of an emperor shouldn't interfere in a dynasty, because that has historically caused disasters for the dynasty, and she didn't really want to shake things up. So she was content with being the perfect supporter, the perfect wife. Once, when Tai Zong was sick with a serious illness, she stayed by his bedside and kept a vial of poison with her, with the intention of dying with him if he succumbed to the illness. She didn't get to do that because she died too early, but another wife of his did. I'm talking about consort Xu Hui, who is often used as a case study against against Wu Zetian because she came into Tai Zong's harem around the same time. It was said that Xu Hui could talk by five months of age, could recite the classics by age four, and could write amazing essays by age eight. Wow, what a child prodigy. What are we gonna do with her talents? Send her into the palace to be one of the emperor's many, many wives, of course. Though unlike Zu Tian, who stayed at the same rank for 12 years, Xu Hui was promoted again and again and was favored by Tai Zong because of her ability to gently advise him, reminding him that previous dynasties collapsed because they built too many palaces and indulged in too many luxuries instead of letting the people rest. When he died, she was like, I literally have nothing else to live for, and so she committed suicide rather than live on without him. <laughs> she was 24. Here's where the problem is. This is not the kind of woman our protagonist Zetian is. Wu Zetian was not born to support anyone. She would not live for any man, nor die for any man. There's only one record of what happened in her life during her time as Taizong's concubine. It tells of how, this one time, Taizong and his entourage were gathered around this mighty stallion of his. It was majestic, but it was very aggressive. When he asked, which of you thinks he can tame this beast? There was silence. But then, Tianish Zetian stepped up. She said, I can tame it if I have three items. First, a whip. Second, an iron hammer. Third, a dagger. If it will not obey upon being stricken with the whip, then I shall bludgeon its head with the hammer. If it still refuses to submit, then I shall slit its throat with a dagger. The only reason this story survived was because she told it herself in her later years, after she was emperor. It was meant to be a cautionary tale to a minister she was talking to, to illustrate how, no matter how talented you are, she had no use for you if you ultimately ultimately won't obey her commands. The story didn't include Tai Zong's reaction to what she said, but I assume he was like, oh, that's nice. Anyway, she didn't have a good time in his harem. She apparently did try to impress him by learning calligraphy, because he wasn't just a mighty warrior emperor who could wield a two meter tall bow, but an art connoisseur. But she had yet to learn the lesson that the harder you try to impress a man, the faster you lose their respect. It's funny, isn't it? The only way to get true male respect is to not care about male approval. I have to mention that Tai Zong did give her a nickname of Mei Niang, meaning charming lady, so he at least liked her on a surface level at some point, but he had no time for her teenage calligraphy. He spent his final years worn out by personal family drama. Remember how he took the throne in an extremely violent coup? Well, the issue with breaking the rules like that is that it sets a terrible precedent. 
because the son of his that was second in line to the throne got the same idea. <laughs> Taizong's original crown prince, Li Chenqian, was once the perfect heir, firstborn of his beloved empress and a promising future emperor. But as he grew up, I think the pressure got to him because he started acting out in all sorts of weird ways like sending an assassin after his tutor and pretending to be dead and even dressing up like a Turkic Khan. He also fell from his horse during a hunting session and got a permanent disability in his leg. He was also probably gay or bisexual because he openly loved this servant of his called Chen Xing and this was considered scandalous. Here, I gotta explain the attitude towards same-sex relationships in ancient China. Don't look at this from a Western Christian perspective. No one in ancient China was yelling, you'll burn in hell at the gays, but rather the reaction was, okay, but you're still gonna get into a heterosexual marriage and have children, right? Because under Confucian principles, continuing your family bloodline was your most important responsibility. So there wasn't this strict dichotomy of homosexuality versus heterosexuality, but rather duty versus pleasure. After you've fulfilled your heterosexual duty, you can go indulge in the gay as a hobby. A guilty pleasure, like going to a brothel. Not something you wanted to be caught in the act of if your image is supposed to be refined and respectable, but not something that would condemn you to eternal damnation in the fiery pits of the afterlife either. The acceptance of it as a vice dependent on your social circle. Problem was, Li Chintian is supposed to be refined and respectable, so Taizong eventually got mad and executed Chen Xing. Li Chintian then got super mad at his dad and built a shrine in his estate for Chen Xing and made all his servants mourn day and night and refused to go to imperial councils for months. <laughs> Meanwhile, Taizong started favoring his second son by Empress Zhangsun, Li Tai, more and more. I think he just meant to do it as a way of motivating Li Chenqian to stop acting out, but it accidentally gave Li Tai too much hope, and it also misled the officials. Cause remember, it wasn't that long ago that Taizong himself pulled off a coup, and all the officials who were aligned with the crown prince then were either killed, demoted, or exiled. So no matter how Taizong insisted that he didn't actually want to change the crown prince, the court split itself into two factions, the We Stand By Crown Prince Chenqian faction, versus the I don't know, Prince Li Tai is pretty promising faction. This drama escalated higher and higher until Crown Prince Chen Tian was exposed for planning his own coup to force his dad to abdicate, just like his dad to his grandpa. Taizong was heartbroken and finally had the talk with Li Tai about potentially making him the new crown prince. During which Li Tai was like, Father Emperor, if you make me your heir, I promise to kill all my children and eventually pass the throne to my little brother so you can rest assured that I am not just doing this for my bloodline. Instead of being touched, Taizong, notable brother and nephew murderer, was like, Oh my god, what the hell is wrong with my sons? Then Taizong went to visit the prisoner formerly known as Crown Prince, and he asked Chen Qian why he tried to pull off the coup. Chen Qian was like, Father, I was already Crown Prince. What more could I have wanted? Do you think I could have done something like this if Li Tai wasn't threatening my life? This made Taizong sink into deep thought. During which, he also noticed that his third and final son by Empress Zhangsun, 16-year-old Li Zhi, was acting unnaturally nervous around him. After much prompting, Li Zhi admitted that his brother Li Tai had tried to convince him that he was in trouble because he had a good relationship with one of their uncles that was involved in the planned coup. This finally made Taizong realize that if he made Li Tai his heir, his other two sons by Empress Zhangsun were not going to survive. Here's the thing about Taizong, he genuinely loved his sons. The ones by Empress Zhangsun anyway, he didn't care about the others. <laughs> so, after consulting with his trusted advisors, he made his decision. Neither Li Chintian nor Li Tai would be his heir. 16-year-old Li Zhi would be crown prince instead. Solely because soft boy Li Zhi was the only son he trusted to not kill the other two the minute after taking the throne. This was not an easy decision for Taizong. In the council meeting where he discussed this with Li Zhi and his chancellors, he apparently cried so hard that he pulled out his sword and tried to kill himself. It was his chancellors that held him back and assured him that they believed Li Zhi could be a great emperor. Li Zhi, standing right there, was probably like, So this is how 16-year-old soft boy Li Zhi found his two older brothers exiled to the borders and himself suddenly the crown prince of the Great Tang Empire. The year is 643, six more years until Taizong dies. I think Taizong could feel his time coming too, even though he was only in his 40s, because he spent the last few years of his life running around pacifying border nations and executing officials that might be too rebellious and personally tutoring Li Zhi, all in hopes that the transition of power would go smoothly. In 645, 
1605, four years before he died, Taizong personally led a campaign against Goguryeo, an ancient Korean kingdom. A campaign that he ended up losing. <laughs> the Koreans actually have a legend where the commander of the Anxi fortress blinded Taizong in one eye with an arrow. This account isn't in Chinese records anywhere, so its authenticity is debatable, but that doesn't stop it from being hilarious because it's adapted into like every K-drama about this era. Anyway, in 649, after a legendary lifetime of co-founding an empire on horseback and then governing it with grace and humility and also overlooking a certain concubine Wu in his harem, Emperor Taizong of Tang died at age 51. Soft boy Li Zhi was so devastated that he couldn't do anything but hold on to the necks of the chancellors his dad had left for him, but the world had to move on. After keeping Taizong's death a secret for a few days so they could get things in order, Li Zhi was coronated as the third emperor of the Tang dynasty at 22 years old. Meanwhile, 26-year-old Zi Tian got yeeted to the Ganyim nunnery with the other concubines who never bore a child for Taizong. Their heads were forcibly shaved and they were expected to stay locked up there as nuns for the rest of their lives. Make no mistake, that should have been her fate. Yet, unbeknownst to anyone else, or she'd be dead, she had a lifeline in the palace. Who? None other than the young new Emperor Li Zhi. Yeah, you know what this supposed soft boy was actually doing while his dad was on his deathbed? Banging concubine Wu. But he couldn't just be like, okay, now that my dad has bit the dust and is in the dirt, let me reveal that I've been banging one of his concubines all along and that I want to keep her in the palace. So Zi Tian had to go to the nunnery. Maybe he would have even forgotten about her in the chaos of all his new emperor duties, but she wrote him a poem which I will translate to the best of my abilities. So deep in thought while watching reds change the greens, so frail I've become in memory of you. If you do not believe the tears I have wept, open this chest and see the marks on my pomegranate dress. Note that the first line is usually interpreted as her thinking about him so hard that she mistook the color red for the color green, but I recently heard about a different interpretation that it's actually meant to be a visual for the changing of the seasons, which makes a lot more sense to me than heartbreaking induced color blindness so I'm gonna go with that instead. Also, from now on, I'm gonna use Li Zhi's emperor title, Gao Zong, because that's what historians usually refer to him as. Anyway, Zi Tian somehow got the poem to Gao Zong, because for the anniversary of his dad's death a year later, he chose to go to the Ganye nunnery to pay his disrespects. When he and Zi Tian saw each other again, they both broke into sobs in front of everyone. And therefore, it became the hottest gossip in the palace that the emperor was in love with a nun who used to be his father's concubine. This hot, juicy goss quickly made it to Empress Wang, the wife that Taizong had appointed to Gaozong. After what must have been an initial wave of fury, she was intrigued. She wondered if this was actually the solution to her most pressing problem. Because here was what was going on in Gaozong's harem by then. This little soft boy had four sons and at least four wives before Zi Tian, including Empress Wang and three consorts. But Empress Wang herself had never borne a child for him, even though she'd been married to him since they were like 13. This threatened her very position as Empress. The wife he most favored was consort Xiao, who had two daughters and a son. Recently, he had given this son the title of the Prince of Yong, which included the capital region. This was a warning sign that he was going to make this son crown prince. That meant Empress Wang was in serious danger of getting replaced by Consort Xiao. So here was her brilliant idea. She would let Gao Zong take the nun he was messing with around into the palace so that he would be distracted from Consort Xiao. Now, I know what you're thinking. This is a horrible plan. But remember, we have hindsight. She didn't. From her perspective, Zi Tian is just a taboo fling that Gao Zong would eventually get tired of and would not dare to give any proper titles to. Not to mention that Zi Tian's family is just new money, while Empress Wang and Consort Xiao's were both actual deep-rooted aristocracy. In the situation that she was in, with the information that she had on hand, Consort Xiao was a much greater threat. So, Empress Wang sent a messenger to tell Zi Tian to start growing her hair out again. About a year later, around the second anniversary of Taizong's death, Empress Wang went up to Gao Zong like, so your majesty, I know about the nun. And before he was like, uh, she continued like, I am fine with it. In fact, I welcome you to take her back to the palace. That is much more sensible than sneaking around all the time, is it not? And of course, he happily obliged. This was another aspect of her plan, that this act of graciousness would score points for her in his heart. It's the equivalent of suggesting a threesome to your husband in hopes of saving your marriage. But what she did not realize was that it's not about what you do for a man or how hard you try to please him. No, it's about whether you and him have a genuine connection and whether he truly respects you. There was nothing wrong with Empress Wang. 
There was genuinely nothing she could have done to salvage the relationship when there was never a connection. Nobody knows this better than Zhe Tian, who spent 12 years as a forgotten concubine in Taizong's harem. If Empress Wang had been born like 20 years earlier, she probably would have had a great life in Taizong's harem instead. She was exactly his type, very prim and proper, everything conventional society says a woman should be. But just like Zhe Tian's first stint in the palace, Empress Wang married the wrong son of heaven. Gao Zong didn't like women like her, he liked his ladies feistier. And the psychology makes sense. He grew up in the palace under the huge shadow of his legendary father, and was under sudden and enormous pressure to live up as a successor. The last thing he wanted when he went to his harem was to see his empress being all, Hello, your majesty. Shall we have dinner now? No, what he wanted at the end of his day was fun and unpredictable. And who was more unpredictable than Wu Zetian? In the first year after she returned to the palace, Zetian was nothing but grateful and respectful to the Empress Wang. But deep, deep down, she was not satisfied with being a rankless mistress. And this was not her first rodeo. Oh no. The great thing for her was that she now had resources she didn't have in her first try, and she had her priorities straight. Whenever Gaozong showered her in gifts, she didn't giggle at them like a little girl, but she gave them away to the eunuchs and palace girls. She made sure to be extra nice to the service workers because she knew what it was like to be seen as less than dirt in the palace. And of course, she knew the power of information. Whenever anything happened in the harem, whenever any concubine made a move, those palace servants would make sure that Zhu Tian would know. She effectively set up a network of spies for herself. Soon after she returned, she got pregnant. To Empress Wang's surprise, Gao Zong eventually promoted Zhu Tian directly to a rank 2 concubine with the title of Zhao Yi. This was so close to the top that Empress Wang started sweating. Then her uncle gave her an idea. She could adopt Gao Zong's eldest son, whose mother was just a random palace maid. This was a perfectly legal way of making a concubine-born son into a formal son. In ancient China, men could have as many concubines as they could financially take care of, but they were only allowed one formal wife. The sons of that wife took precedence when it came to inheritance. Like, even though Gao Zong was Taizong's ninth son overall, he was the third son of Empress Zhang Sun, so he had always been third in line for the throne. The sons of concubines are still considered legitimate children, but they're lower in status than formal sons. A formal wife could adopt a concubine-born son to elevate his status, but it's a risky move because if she then has any biological sons of her own, they would rank lower than that adopted kid because of birth order. That's why this adoption was probably considered a last ditch move by Empress Wang. She was still like maybe 23, 24, too young to be sure if she's really infertile. But with both Consort Xiao and Wu Zetian looming in the harem, Empress Wang had no choice but to go through with the adoption. Then, since Li Zhong was now considered a formal son, Gao Zhong had no choice but to make him crown prince. Sometime around that, Zetian gave birth to a boy. She named him Li Hong, which is significant because it references the name that the legends say Laozi, the founder of Daoism, will have upon his reincarnation. Laozi is also special to the imperial clan because his birth name is Li Er, so the Li family considers him an ancestor. Thus, you can see Zhe Tian's ambition showing its edge right there in the name. The position of crown prince may have been filled just in time, but... She has her sights on it. Meanwhile, things are also heating up in the outer court. When Taizong died, he left Gao Zong with several experienced chancellors, the most respected of which was Zhang Sun Wu Ji, the late Empress Zhang Sun's brother, so Taizong's brother-in-law and Gao Zong's uncle. And he didn't just get this position because of nepotism. He was genuinely talented and capable. Empress Zhang Sun had actually begged Taizong to not employ her family members in such high positions because she worried that things might go wrong. But her brother was so talented and such a good childhood friend of Taizong's that he couldn't let him go. Though this might have caused Zhang Sun Wu Ji to feel a little too comfortable in his position. The year after Zhe Tian and Gao Zong's first son was born, another conspiracy in the imperial family was exposed. This time, it was Gao Zong's own sister, Princess Gao Yang, and her husband plotting to make one of their uncles emperor. This presented a golden opportunity to Zhang Sun Wu Ji. He immediately took over investigation of the case and implicated basically every person in the court who posed a threat to his young emperor nephew. It was a huge wave of demotions and executions, implicating several of Gao Zong's brothers and uncles. But there's one most prominent threat that Zhang Sun Wu Ji overlooked. Himself. 
Now, I am actually pretty sure that he genuinely had Gao Zong's best interests in mind, and had no actual desire for the throne, but the amount of power he was wielding now made him the de facto ruler of the court, and thus of the empire. Every official looked to him for guidance. Nothing could be done without his approval. You simply can't overshadow your emperor like that without him starting to resent you. Back in the harem, in a twist of irony, former rivals Empress Wang and Consort Xiao have realized Zhe Tian is the true final boss, and have joined forces. They spent all their time with Gao Zong talking smack about Zhe Tian, while Zhe Tian spent all her time with Gao Zong talking smack about them. But no matter how heated the drama got, Gao Zong was keeping a neutral stance for now, like, yeah, yeah, she's a b I know. No problem, sweetheart, I'll go talk to her. But nothing would change. What ultimately broke this stalemate is the infamous death of Zhe Tian and Gao Zong's first daughter. Some of you have probably heard of this before, that the only female emperor in Chinese history killed her own baby daughter to frame her rival. My opinion on this is... I don't think she did it. Not because she's not capable of it, like you should see the stuff she does later on, but it doesn't make much strategic sense. Empress Wang is famous for being calm and collected. She doesn't give off enough of a baby killer vibe to justify intentionally murdering a baby in hopes of framing her. What I think is that the baby died of some unknown other cause because of the very high infant mortality rates in ancient times. Then, instead of collapsing in grief, Zhe Tian made the best out of the situation by trying to incriminate Empress Wang, which didn't work, by the way. There was no proof of a murder beyond how Empress Wang happened to have shown up to visit the baby earlier that day, because it was custom for empresses to do stuff like that. Empress Wang could not be incriminated on just that. Also, it's extremely suspicious that in the earlier surviving record of this incident, it just says the princess died suddenly. Yet in later texts, compiled centuries after, the story suddenly starts gaining more and more details, like Zhe Tian personally strangling her baby, and the way she screamed and cried when pretending to discover the death later on, and Gao Zong's imperial rage when he was told that Empress Wang was the last person to visit the baby. It's just, it's just very suspiciously detailed is all. And we know the compiler of those later texts hated Wu Zetian, but even though no one was ever found responsible for the baby's death, the incident did change one thing. Gao Zong made the decision in his mind that he wanted Zhe Tian to be his empress. He must have promised Zhe Tian too, because they went together to Zhang Sun Wuji's estate with several carriages of gifts and treasures. At dinner with him, Gao Zong was like, it's really a shame that Empress Wang can't have any children, isn't it? But you know what's great? Concert Wu here bore me a son and a daughter. Rest in peace. And now she's pregnant again. She's very fertile. Zhang Zuan and Wu Ji, of course, would have realized that Gao Zong was testing the waters for deposing Empress Wang. But changing the Empress is a very serious thing, and in Wu Ji's mind, there wasn't really a good reason to go through the hassle, so he signaled his disapproval by just changing the topic. Gao Zong then subtly brought the issue up several more times, but Wu Ji waved it off each time. By the end of this water testing session, it was clear that the water did not want the Empress change to happen. But Gao Zong and Zhe Tian did not give up. The next year, Zhe Tian pulled off the the oldest trick in the harem, accusing Empress Wang and the Empress's mother of trying to curse her with voodoo dolls. Seriously, you can see this accusation happened in like every harem drama ever. This is because sorcery or witchcraft is an extremely serious crime in the harem, and yet it's also extremely easy to plank fake evidence of it in someone's residence. Empress Wang was again not criminalized or deposed as a direct result of this, but her mother was banned from visiting her in the palace. What this did was cut off Empress Wang's main line of communication to the outside world. Then, Gao Zong announced in court that he wanted to make Zhe Tian a rank one consort. But even that had a roadblock, because in the Tang Dynasty harem system, you could only have four rank one consorts, and they each had a specific title. All four slots were already taken in Gao Zong's harem, so what he wanted to do instead was invent a brand new one just for Zhe Tian, Chen Fei, consort of the Polar Star. This name is, again, significant, because the Polar Star is often a symbol for the emperor. So this title essentially means, I know there's already an empress, but her? Consort Wu, that's my real top hoe right there. The chancellors that Taizong left for Gao Zong, send note to this. Even this. Now it's on. Now it's about more than Zhe Tian getting a higher title. Now it's about Gao Zong's authority. Now it's a partisan issue. 
The other officials in the court began to take notice and take sides. You are either for the concept of Empress Wu, vocally against it, or neutral and silent. To stay silent is the safest option because all you have to do is let the senior officials speak up and keep the status quo. But if you choose to support Zhe Ting becoming Empress, you gain the immediate favor and notice of the young emperor at the cost of making yourself an enemy of the senior officials. The first prominent official to do this is Li Yifu, who pissed off Zhang Sun Wuji one day and was facing a demotion out of the capital region. Before his demotion order would be processed by the imperial clerks the next day, he ran to the palace at night and asked to meet the emperor. In front of Gao Zong, he kotoed over and over and claimed that the people of the Great Tang were begging for Zhe Tian to become their empress. Gao Zong was like, they are? Okay. <laughs> And then he gifted Li Yifu a string of pearls as an incentive to keep up the good job relaying the wishes of the people. Li Yifu was like, Oh, your majesty, I would love to keep doing that, but I'm getting demoted out of the capital tomorrow. To which Gao Zong was like, Easy fix. Not only did he stop the demotion, he promoted Li Yifu a few days later. Hearing news of this, more and more officials dared to take the risk and pledge their support for Zhe Tian becoming empress. Especially the lowborn officials stuck near the bottom of the ranks because they didn't have the connections to rise higher. They couldn't have hoped to squeeze into the circles of the old officials anyway, so why not get a rapid promotion out of throwing their weight behind the young emperor being able to make the woman she loves empress? Finally, after the pro Zhe Tian faction has gained in substantial numbers, we enter the endgame. On the first day of the ninth month of the year 655, four years after Gao Zong took Zhe Tian back to the palace, he summoned his chancellors for a private meeting. The chancellors knew what it was going to be about. One of them dodged the meeting by claiming he's sick, while the others coordinated beforehand. Chancellor Chu Suiliang volunteered to be the one to tell the emperor no. After the meeting started, as they expected, Gao Zong outright declared his intention of deposing Empress Wang and making Zhe Tian Empress. Chu Sui Liang was immediately like, But your majesty, Empress Wang did not do anything wrong, and she was the wife chosen for you by your father. The others also showed their disapproval by silence, and so the meeting ended in a stalemate. The next day, Gao Zong again called a meeting with the chancellors. This time, Chu Sui Liang got fed up and said, Okay, your majesty, we can support you changing your empress if you really want to, but your new empress has to be chosen among the daughters of the aristocracy, not concubine. Wu, who everyone knows was your father's concubine. Gao Zong was already aghast that Chu Sui Liang would bring this up, but Chu Sui Liang took it even further. He was like, if my advice means nothing to your majesty anymore, then I might as well quit my position and go back to my hometown. Then he threw his jade tablet. Officials in ancient China held these long jade tablets in their hands when they went to imperial council meetings. He threw the tablet to the ground and kotoed until his forehead bled. Infuriated, Gao Zong called for his guards to drag Chu Sui Liang away. But of course, Chu Suilang didn't actually want to quit, so he struggled against the soldiers. Just then, a female voice rang out through the throne room. Why not kill this bastard? Zhe Tian shouted, hidden behind the throne. The historical records did not include the exact reactions of the chancellors, but I assume they were shook because a mere concubine is not supposed to be in the throne room listening to this discussion. I bet even Gao Zong did not expect her to start yelling. The tense silence that follows is broken by the ever so reliable Zhang Sun Wuji, who calmly says that it would not be a wise idea to execute Chu Sui Liang because he is a tenured chancellor appointed by Tai Zong himself. And then we go on to the third day. Surely news about the commotion in the throne room had spread like wildfire through the court by now. Two chancellors submitted letters warning Gao Zong that making Zhe Tian empress would surely bring ruin to the dynasty. He must have been in quite the frustrating situation. On the fourth day, he summoned the final chancellor who had dodged all the meetings so far to force him to give his position. Finally, this chancellor said, Your majesty, this is your personal family matter. Why ask anyone else? This declaration, seemingly simple, completely shifts the tides. Because this chancellor, Li Ji, was a major military commander during the founding of the dynasty. He had such influence among the army that when Tai Zong was on his deathbed, he exiled Li Ji to test his loyalty because he was worried that like his son wouldn't be able to hold him down. Gao Zong was told that if Li Ji refused to leave, he must be executed. But if he does leave, which he did, Gao Zong can then call him back to the capital after he takes the throne so that Li Ji would owe him a favor. Li Ji, taking the position of do what you want, your majesty, I'm not gonna stop you, gave Gao Zong the assurance that he now had enough political sway to make this happen without an ending a disaster. So he was like, you know what? 
you're right. And then he issued the edict to depose of Empress Wang and Consort Xiao by accusing them of trying to poison him. Their families were exiled to the frontier because whole families were often punished for one person's crime back then. And Chu Suiliang was demoted out of the capital as well. With this, Gao Zong finally could not be stopped from making Zhe Tian his former wife, his empress. After 18 years as a concubine to two emperors, she got what she wanted. She had risen to the top of the harem. She was 32. He was 28. Coincidentally, the same age that his dad pulled off his infamous coup for the throne. After her grand coronation, Zhe Tian broke custom once again and became the first empress to personally meet with all the officials and tribal envoys at the front gates of the palace. This was an unsubtle declaration that things were going to change around here. She knew that she had become a symbol of the struggle between the aristocratic families that had dominated Chinese politics for centuries and the commoner class officials who wanted a system where they could rise by their merits instead of being stuck at the bottom. So what will she do with her newfound power? How will she punish those who try to stop her from having it? How will she remove the crown prince that's already there so she can install her own son? What will happen to the deposed Empress Wang and Consort Xiao? How will Zhe Tian eventually become emperor herself? Find out next time on Dragon Ball, I mean, Xiran Talks Wu Zhe Tian Episode 2, The Empress Who Became an Emperor. Honestly though, there are so many lessons to be learned just by her journey to becoming empress alone. She was married to Emperor Taizong, considered one of the greatest emperors in Chinese history and one of the most accomplished men in history in general. Yet she got nothing out of the relationship except 12 lonely years. But did she let that destroy her sense of self-worth? No, she kept being herself and she found a man who will literally fight his whole court of officials to share his empire with her. You cannot control the way men treat you. It's all on them, not you. Anyway, if you're a longtime viewer of my channel, you probably know that I wrote a book called Iron Widow that reimagines the rise of Empress Wu but with giant mechas. If you decide to grab it when it releases on September 21st, buy links at ironwidow.com, please do not expect historical accuracy from the book. It is not historical fiction or alternate reality. It's set in a sci-fi world that's like completely different from ours. I took a lot of creative liberties to better express the themes that I wanted to, such as reimagining Zhe Tian as a girl from a frontier peasant family with terrible parents instead of new money family with supportive parents. And I didn't just adapt people and cultural concepts from the Tang Dynasty. It's more like Chinese history all-stars. So like, please do not be surprised when the information in this video is different from like what got put into the book, okay? Because historical accuracy is what this video series is for, not my science fiction books. For this series, I'm heavily referencing actual historical records and a lecture series by Chinese historian and professor Meng Man. If you can speak Mandarin, I highly recommend the lecture series. It's like available right on YouTube. Unfortunately, I can't make any recommendations for English stuff since I don't read Chinese history books in English. The names are romanized differently depending on like which year the book came out. It's just, and it's just annoying like to be missing that layer of but if you want to see more videos of me talking about Chinese history and myth, please consider supporting me on Patreon or tipping me on Ko-fi. On Patreon, you can get updates about where I am with the videos instead of waiting in the void and like not even knowing what I'm going to do. And you can also suggest and vote on future topics and join my Discord if you're of a certain tier. Also, there are exclusive videos of my cat. Shoutouts to my Patreon guardian lions, Benji Sudoken, Darian, Do It Out of Spite, Jose Barasquez, Kaguga, Kites Universe, Molly McAllister, Nicholas Coates, and Pinky the Smart Elf. Finally, again, this video was sponsored by Surfshark VPN, which you can try out with the link in the description. Sponsorships help creators keep making content, and therefore, see you next time.